McKenzie, space again, gets the pass away for Lamb Kira Fano, welcome to the All Black Podcast. Robert Dunn, your host in the studio, and today we don't want to be left behind this this modern trend of zooming. So we've uh, we've decided to zoom our first guest in, um, probably Scotland's best export, um, or you know closely in behind Sean Connery or, or some of the more famous names. Um, All Black Sevens coach Clark Laidlaw, welcome, mate. Hey, good day. How are you doing? Yeah, very good. And. Uh, on my research, I uh, saw you're an avid coffee drinker. Have you sorted yourself out this morning with a double shot? Are you good to go? Have you got some energy? Yeah, always good to go. So, yeah, traditional long black on the way in. So it's, uh, it's certainly New Zealand shit, my coffee drinking, that's for sure. <laughs> and you're in, um, based down in the mountain there with the sevens, you've got plenty of options, don't you? If you can, do you spread it around or have you got just your trusty calf, your trusty barista that you go to because you know the standard and level of coffee? Yeah, we like to share it around. It's, uh, it's hard push to find a bad coffee in the mountain, isn't it? So we're pretty lucky. Um, we share it around, but uh, mixtures are a local spot in the way into Blake Park here, so they, they get most of the custom, I guess. Yeah, and oh, I'm assuming um, it's another 23 degree, degree day, clear blue skies um, in Mount Monganui. Yeah, not a cloud in the sky. So it's, uh, as we are just saying, we, we live in the dream when it comes to training outside and you know, playing a sport that, that required you to be outside. So, so now it's another ripper here. It's, uh, the, the weather seems to have settled again and, you know, we're in for a, hopefully a long autumn. Awesome, mate. And, you know, as I mentioned to you when we were getting ready for this, we don't often have um, too many guests from outside of New Zealand, so it's awesome to have you on and it seemed like a really good opportunity to talk about the Six Nations. Uh, when this podcast goes out, the final game between Scotland and France would have been played. Um, your predictions, firstly, for that one, knowing that uh, you'll be held to account? <laughs> yeah, well, we've not won often in, in Paris. Um, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a difficult place to go and go and win. But, you know, I do think Scotland have made some progress, as have France. Um, you know, for people that have watched the Six Nations, it's certainly been a tight competition, hasn't it? So, you know, I see Scotland have, have managed to get a few of the players released from the English clubs for, for Friday night. Um Local boy Sean Maitland's not been released, um, oh, you know, really? which because it falls outside of the window. Eh? Like that's what's happened. It yeah. falls outside of that traditional Six Nations window. So club control. Yeah. yeah, you know, you'd think in the modern world around, you know, what's happened in the last year that you know maybe a compromise could have been met for for a one-off game that you know was not not in the usual circumstances. But you know, I think I think Scotland all. You know, I think they'll push France. It'll be interesting. France have obviously got a chance now to go on and win if they win well. So there'll be plenty of motivation for, for both teams. And it's, um, I mean, the last couple of years, and you know a lot more about this because I've followed from a distance, but Scotland have gone up a couple of levels, I think. They pushed France, um, who are a very strong side at the moment at the start of the year um, in, the, in the delayed Six Nations. And, and they've had a couple of close, close losses this year, they'd, they'd have to back themselves going in. And also, there's no crowd, so while well, obviously playing away in Paris is, you know, you'd rather be at home at Murrayfield, but without the crowd influence and the French love their footy, that's got to be a bit of a leveller as well, perhaps. Yeah, I think you look at world sport, that home advantage, you know, where you're looking at basketball or rugby or, or yeah. football, it's it's not quite the same, is it? But, you know, the, the challenge always for Scotland is we're, you know, we're a small, small nation that are playing against you know, really good teams. The Six Nations doesn't really give you much of a breathing space. Obviously, Italy are, are struggling a little bit, but the, the rest of the teams are, you know, traditionally, you know, four of the top 10 teams in the world. So it's it's always difficult. I think Scotland will probably look back a little bit frustrated. Um, you know, they had, they had Wales under the pump just before half time, And, you know, I think if they'd scored off a scrum, they'd have scrum under their post. They would have went, you know, three scores in front against Wales with, with half a rugby to go, having beaten England in the first game away. So... You know, if they beat France, they'll they'll still think it's a success. You know, I genuinely think that they could have, you know, they could have went close to winning the championship this year if they put Wales away that day. And but that's the fine lines, isn't it? You know, Wales will be saying the same with with that try. They lost the last play of the game against France for a for a grand slam. So, you know, it is an exciting competition. You know, it's it's not quite the same without the fans, but it's certainly been an exciting close competition with you know with anybody beating anybody in, apart from the Italians. Oh, uh, for sure. I mean. You know, at the start of the tournament, you would have put all your money on England and France. Um, you would have put no money on Wales, but they've come through and for a, for a, it all it looked like they were going to be Grand Slam champions there for 
you know, 81 minutes. Um, it just shows mm-hmm. how tight that comp is and, and it doesn't take too much um, to get it just right or just wrong, does it? No, and that's, that's international sport, isn't it? You know, we, we see that in sevens, you see it with all blacks. Um, there's not much between the top teams anymore. Um, you know, the professionalism and the coaching and the, um, you know, the level of play around the world is is really evened out. So it's, um, as you say, Wales were, you know, a minute away from winning a Grand Slam. You know, six months ago, they'd lost, was it 10 games or yeah. nine or 10 games? So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine margins, um, which which you want in a national sport. That's that's what makes it attractive. It's get people to the stadiums when they're allowed and gets people watching on TV, brings the money in. So, so it's it's good. Totally. And while, um, you know, unfortunately we haven't been able to have crowds for those fixtures up in the Northern Hemisphere, it's still pretty cool to be able to to see the tournament go ahead. I've got a couple of mates um, actually up in Edinburgh um, who I talked to a little bit on Zoom and and they've had the kids at home for four or five months. They've been in various degrees of lockdowns for a very, very long time, haven't been able to get out and socialise. So at least, at the very least, um, they've got a Six Nations to watch um, and support um, during what's a pretty tough time and, and sometimes we forget about that when we're down here and we're able to go along to a, a super rugby game or, or like you say down there, get out, yeah. get outside and train under the big blue. Yeah, and you know, unless you really look overseas, you know, you've not got a job or family over there or mates. Um, we, we're probably forgetting how tough everybody's still doing it. You know, I've got a lot of family and friends. That some of them are doing their second birthdays in lockdown. You know, it's been a full year and a bit since since they went into lockdown. And you know, I think it has showed us how important sport is to to people around the world. Um, you know, what sort of release it gives us um, gives us enjoyment, um, excitement, and I guess takes our mind off you know, how tough sometimes, uh, you know, this p- pandemic's been. So, so I really do think it's, you know, it really does show the, the real benefits to sport, you know, and it, I guess at the community level, it also shows what we're really missing, especially, you know, overseas. Um, you know, for fact, a lot of the club sides and, and people just in general, I've got nieces and nephews that have not been able to do any school sport for a year, yeah. you know, so hopefully they're coming through the other side of it and, we can get not only the professional sport up and running, but you know, for health and well-being, just in general, to get everybody back out there playing various sports. Yeah, no, I've I've said it a couple of times on the podcast. The probably the the most excitement or enjoyment I saw in our local community was when we could get down and to under nine and under ten rugby again, and just wasn't just about the kids playing, but just the fact to grab a coffee and have a natter with other parents on the sideline on a Saturday morning was you just realise how much you missed it. So we're very fortunate to be able to do that and hopefully they can in other parts of the world. Quickly as well, like lastly on Northern Hemisphere chat, um, I see um, that it looks like it's all go for the British and Irish Lions to head to South Africa, Mm. which is fantastic because, you know, there's... um, never sure if that was going to be um, postponed or cancelled or not, like... On the on the Scottish side of things, um, who do you hope to see getting that team? Because you've got some players that are actually playing really, really well. Um, you hope to see five or six Scotsmen make that trip. Yeah, I would love to see it. You know, there's, there's I guess there's the obvious around Stuart Hogg. Um, you know, he's been a standout fullback for a few years now in the UK, and um, Finn Russell is obviously touted. But you know, I think that that ten position is going to be really interesting. Who they select there? You know, with Johnny Sexton having a a really good Six Nations or the back end of the Six Nations. You know, Biggers had a, a really good year with, with Wales. So I think, you know, I think Scotland have definitely got, you know, a number of players, especially up front, probably for the first time, you know, with guys like Gray and, you know, even Rory Sutherland, people like that, that, um, you know, the loose forwards have, have had, had a good year. Um, Who's that mad dog? Force their way in. Who's that mad dog with the mullet? He looks like he should be playing for the South and Stags. He goes real good. His name just went out of my head. Uh, Watson, Hamish Watson. <laughs> so he's um, he, he's an outstanding player. But if you look at guys like Tipperick and you know Curry in, in England, and you know the, you can see why it's such a, a difficult team to pick. And yeah. as a Scotsman, you know you, you want you know you want five or six there. But the reality will be it's it's going to be difficult again to get more than three or four. I would think um, you know some of the English guys probably haven't had as good a year as as they would like. And, and Gatland traditionally will pick. You know, he, he picks traditionally players that play the style of rugby he, he wants to play and, and sometimes Scotland play, a, you know, a different game to, to that. So, so it will be interesting, you know, it's, it's amazing if it goes ahead. Um, 
you know, I guess as a, as a Scottish young fella growing up, uh, the 1996 Lions, was it 97? 97 um, to Africa. Uh, Jim Telfer and, and oh. Ian McGeeke, you know, two Scottish coaches, um, you know, really shaped shaped the Lions in the professional era, didn't it? Um, and, you know, I think going back to South Africa, it's always a massive challenge um, physically. So, so if it goes ahead in South Africa, you know, it'll be, it'll be great viewing. Um, you know, it'll be, it'll be exciting times for everybody involved again. Oh, mate, how good are those Living With The Lions uh, shows when Jim Telfer's giving one of his his speeches, my God, he's cut from an old school cloth, isn't he? He knew how to how to stir the emotions. Yeah. It used to get me fired up, and I was going nowhere to play. Yeah, no yeah. Well, I was lucky. I actually coached with Jim for two years with the border under 16 and 18 sides um, before I came to New Zealand. And um, <laughs> what an experience it was. It was um, He coached under 16s like he was coaching the British Lions. His standards oh. and his enthusiasm was, you know, and he, and he was involved with rugby. We talk about club rugby. He was involved with uh, Melrose under 18s. You know, I'm not sure if he still is, but all the way through in his seventies. Yeah. Um, so he's he's an awesome man. Um, you know, and I can still remember speaking about coming to New Zealand um, before I left. I, I asked him what his opinion was, and you know, he was he was a big um, you know he was a big supporter of New Zealand rugby. He was a big fan of how they played the game. You know, traditionally Scotland and New Zealand, the rock and run type game back in the 80s when Scotland was successful was you know was built you know largely influenced on on how New Zealand played the game and. And Jim was a big driver in that. So you're right, it was, um, you know, if you're too high, then you're too high and I'll be the judge. <laughs> That's right. Something that always stuck in my head. Uh, mate, he was brilliant. He was actually, um, joke about the old schoolness, but he actually, um, when you look at it more closely, he seemed a really good mix of the old school and the new school. Like he was opening new things, wasn't he? And he was absolutely dedicated to his craft, but he just had that hard old school mm-hmm. edge about him. Yeah, exactly right, mate. You know, he was he was way ahead of his time. Him and Ian McGee came around how they wanted to play the game and keep the ball alive. Um, you know, a lot of things now we do around continuity in the game. You know, Jim and, and Ian McGee had the Lions doing that back in 97 and, you know, it really worked against that, a big South African team. So you're right, that, that real balance. And I think that is that of coaching. You know, old, there's nothing wrong with old school values and, and hard work and discipline. Um, if you can marry that up with the the new generation of player and how they learn and, and how they want their information, it's, uh, it's a good mix. Totally, and that's um, to bring you on to your current role, coach of the All Black Sevens. Um, firstly, mate, are the, tic- are the tickets booked? Are we on? Are we going to Tokyo? I think so. Um, <laughs> yeah, This time last year I thought so too, but <laughs> no, yeah, I think all indications are that it's going to go ahead. You know, you've seen the stuff come out this week around no overseas fans, um, but Japanese fans in the stadiums. Um, it certainly feels through NZOC, all the communication we've had has been really positive around it going ahead. Um, we're starting to pre- prepare around how we travel there, um, you know, how we get into the country safely. Um, what sort of requirements there's going to be around, you know, obviously COVID and, and so on. So, you know, there's, there's no indication that we've seen that, that would suggest it's now not going to go ahead. And again, you know, talking about the, the Lions tour, if the Lions tour can go ahead from Britain to to South Africa, people are now finding a way to to navigate, you know, navigate their way through COVID and quarantines and so on to run safe events, um, you know, whether it be tennis in Australia or, you know, sport down here or around the world so we're pretty confident mate and we're you know we're preparing accordingly that we think it'll go ahead yeah that's awesome i, I desperately hope it does because i know um so many people put a huge amount of work into it so um just flick back a year um you know when started to have world seven series tournaments cancelled and 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 uh, tokyo got postponed um I was wondering, a lot of the lads um, went back to club rugby, went to, back to Mitre 10, cup rugby. In some ways, in reflection, was that a good thing? It gave a natural break from the, the week-in, week-out grind because you guys do work bloody hard. And it was, for me personally, as someone who um, loves my community rugby, loves to get down and, and watch my local club stuff because I'm based in the Bay of Plenty and, and so are you and so are the Sevens boys. There was a, a bunch of boys playing club rugby, which was awesome. And there was also a bunch of boys playing Mitre 10 cup. Um, which was fantastic to see as well. Added a new dynamic. Was that good for the lads? Yeah, it was awesome. You know, it was um, it was a tough period. You know, it's a year a year since really we we went into lockdown and um, we were laughing about the Zoom. You know, this time last year I wasn't sure what Zoom was, and this, you know, <laughs> now now I feel like I'm becoming a a regular visitor to Zoom each day. So 
But getting back into our queries, um, you know, both the male and female sevens players was, you know, was really special. You know, we had four of our boys playing together in a club team that made the semi-finals here for the first time. Uh, we had a lot of guys, you say, played in might have 10. You know, we had people like Portia Woodman that had never played for Northland before. Um, Sarah going back and playing for Manama 2 and, and, and the like. So it was, you know, I think it's really important that we don't forget what, you know, what that community game gives us because that's where we all start. You know, we all play school and club rugby and come through. And I guess sometimes when you become a professional, you get, you get caught up in, you know, we think this is the normal world where the normal world's not here. You know, we're, we're an elite few, you know, we're, we're such a small percentage of the sporting population. It's really important that we, we reconnect with that. But it was also really, it gave the guys a real lift coming back here because the, I guess the, they realise how much they love this team and, and love playing sevens. Uh, they realise how you know how well we train and how well they're looked after um, around the support of the team. So I think it's given us a real boost that we might never have got. You know, we might have rolled into the Olympics. You know, win, loser. You know, we we thought we were in a really good spot, but I think it's made us really like stronger off the field as a group. It, it's made us really appreciate and have gratitude to to how we live and how we play and how we train. Um, so I genuinely think it's going to make us, you know, make us stronger come July because it's it's given us a bit more, you know, it's given us a bit more reality, I guess, and a dose of perspective on not only community sport, but might have 10 and, and sevens because there's, there's still the hang-up, you know, there's still a lot of perception that players need to be in 15s, you know, that sevens has to be a step in stone. And I think a lot of our players have actually realised that you know, how much they love playing sevens, you know, they don't have to worry about malls and scrum <laughs> resets and and they can just enjoy, you know, getting the ball in their hands and, and ball movement and, you know, and a real attacking uh, flowing game that, that sevens is. So, you know, in a, in a strange sort of way, I think, I think this break and, and COVID has made us stronger, you know, now does that mean we'll win in July? I'm not sure, but it, it's certainly, um, certainly re-energised the whole group, coaches, players, staff, um, so yeah that's you know it, it's in a strange sort of way it's, it's actually been really enjoyable and also too mate uh, you know downside of COVID is we didn't have Jock Hobbs under 19 and we didn't have our under 20s and there's a number of things we weren't able to do or, or were postponed last year for a number of reasons but also um, it meant probably it was an opportunity for you to look at um, that next tier of talent, whether it's the Red Bullock Night Tournament or um, some more domestic stuff where there's a bunch of young fellas who maybe normally would be tied up in a rep program or a tournament were actually um, you know, out um, in the in the Red Bullock Night Tournament and, and showing what they've got on the sevens pitch. Yeah, well, that December window was amazing for us because you're right, usually we're away. Um, players are locked up into you know provincial teams and so on, so... The Red Bull was an was an amazing week. Um, you know, New Zealand rugby's vision is to unite and inspire New Zealanders. Now, anybody that came to that week and watched 16, 17-year-old girls and boys play alongside the best rugby players in, in their sport in sevens in the world, what an amazing experience. What, what a great concept to have, you know, Caleb Tangatau from Westlake Boys, who's now training with us and had his 18th birthday here last week. Now, he was a 17-year-old playing alongside Regan Weir and Scott Curry and yeah. being coached off Tomasi Thama. I'm not sure you'll get that any, in any sport anywhere else in the world, where you've got the national coaches, national players, coaching and playing alongside, you know, school boys and girls. Um, so it was great, you know, and then, and then we were able to back that up with going up to watch in Auckland the, the two weeks of sevens, where the national schools, comp, you know, the Condors competition and then the world schools competition the week after. So... It was great to be involved. Um, great to see, you know, as I say, male and female players playing sevens and, and really enjoying sevens over a three-week spell. That again, traditionally, we're we're not even in the country to see any of that. So it was um, it was really unique, and it's something we really need to think about. How do we continue, you know, that concept of Red Bull, where you get the best players in the world helping coach and play alongside up and coming, you know, athletes. Really, oh uh, yeah, it's it's got a accelerate development doesn't it and there's um what so today where are we at today like because while um you know you're able to train and I think you've got is it 20 or 24 contracted players down there at Blake Park um there still is no um world series tournaments to play at the moment so no events to build to 
so to speak. So um, how does that change things for you? How do you prepare the lads for, you know, hopefully in July, you know, the highest level of sevens that they're possibly going to play? Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> I don't know if exciting is the right word. It's, um, it's definitely a different challenge, isn't it? Trying to appear at a, a pinnacle event of five years of work. Um, potentially having not played a live tournament for a year and a half <laughs> seems uh, a bit of a sick joke but now we, we, we're, we're really conscious of the, the natural flow of, of sevens which is you know you build up to a tournament you get selected you play you drop back off um, and you go again so we're I guess in our training cycles we're, we're trying to get that natural rhythm of four or five weeks at a time so we've arranged a tournament down in Wellington um, I think it's the 7th, 8th and 9th of of April, where we're going to go down there. Both both teams have two teams. Um, the, the males, we, the men's team, we're going to play against Tonga and a Samoan select side. And it's going to coincide alongside our Super Rugby team on the, our Super Rugby game on the Sunday. So, so that's our next, you know, that's our next, um, you know, window to play. Um, the, the travel bubble at the minute is starting to look a little bit more, you know, possible. So getting to Australia to play against Australia and Fiji is something we've. We've been talking about a lot with with both those countries, so that May window, uh, um, you know, there might be potential now to to get over there and come back. And then the June window, you know, we've got another window there where you know our last selection, uh, we got we got a name or team by the twenty eighth of of June. Yeah. How many? So we're looking how many, at you know how many names for the plane for that? Yeah. Uh, so thirteen. You know. So it's, it's twelve. Tough, eh? Twelve are stripped. Yeah, it's gonna be tough. It's um, well, I hope it's tough. You know, I hope we have 20, you know, we do have 20 fully contracted, but, you know, four guys in training at the minute. We're hopeful we'll get another couple of super rugby players to come back and um, post the first two, you know, the, the New Zealand rounds of Aotearoa. Yeah. Um, you know, we're hoping there's going to be two or three boys come back from that. So hopefully we've got a squad of, you know, 24, 25 to select from. And, you know, we, we talk every day as coaches how tough some of those selections are going to be. So we've got to be, we got to really give them genuine opportunity to play, you know. So we're really committed to finding windows where we we play live tournaments to give, you know, because we have developed a strong squad um, over the last three years. So it's really important we give them genuine opportunity to play and put their hand up for selection. And mate, what do we know? What's happening around the world? We're, you know, well things are bloody tough here, and like you say, there's um, it's not the natural rhythm of a sevens calendar, but. You know, what's going on in other parts of the world? What are the Fijians doing? What are the South Africans doing? Are they able to at least do stuff internally? I, I, do you know it all? Oh, well, we, we do a little bit. You know, Fiji, um, you know, they're, they're busy playing a, a seven series. It's, I think it's maybe six weekends long. So they've just had the third one of that where they're obviously playing internal um, competition. And they just, play at lunchtime the and they just play at lunchtime <laughs> in every village in Fiji anyway, don't they? So there's no issues there. Well... They're not, they're going to be short of competition, you know. And <laughs> their strength will be will be that. I guess their weakness will be they're playing against the same style, yeah, um, which is very different to what they're going to face come July. South Africa, there was a tournament in Madrid um, a couple of weeks back where Argentina and the USA and Spain and so on got together. Um, South Africa had planned to get there, but they didn't get there, um, you know, at the last minute. So they're a little bit like us, where they'll be creating internal competitions. South Africa, as I say, Argentina, USA, they travel to Madrid, so. So there is, there is varying degrees. The Great Britain side have now got together full time. So they've assembled both both squads um, in the UK of, I think it's maybe 21 or 24 players. So they're now training full time, you know, similar to us. So, and I think that that is it. We, you know, playing against ourselves, yeah, we don't get different styles, which is something we're really conscious of and we're trying to manipulate in training to give us some different pictures and training. But the way we trained yesterday was... You know, it was as good as any World Series game anywhere. Um, we had an unbelievable day yesterday where where the guys really go toe-to-toe. Uh, it wasn't fully live yesterday, but, you know, I think by the time we play in Wellington in two weeks' time, apart from Fiji and South Africa and, you know, and in the USA, who, who who give us real different pictures, Australia, you know, Australia are a bit similar to us. They're desperate to, to try and get games against us because they're, they're just playing internally. Um, us against us is as good as any game you're going to get. It's, it's just the different styles that, that really, I guess, makes us a little bit um, uneasy around how we prepare for that. But, you know, we, we do have a lot of experienced players that understand what the different teams bring. Yeah. And is, um, do you expect, once we get to the Olympics, you know, it's 
it's going to be Fiji, it's going to be South Africa, but I, you know, I do understand that in any given tournament, that's the great thing about sevens, to be honest, is when you you flick it on to watch that Kenya, the USA, um, you know, France at different times can win games, can win tournaments. But do you expect um, Fiji and South Africa to be as sharp as they have been um, the last pre- the previous seasons? Yeah, I think so, mate. I think they're the you know between the three of us, we've won a lot of the, the big tournaments over the last few years. But you know, we'd be naive to think that an Argentina can't beat us. You know, they've beat us a couple of times over the last few years. Um, France, you just touched on there. They, they obviously still need to qualify France, but man, they made a couple of finals last year. Um, they made a, another couple of semi-finals. They, I think, they were the big movers last year. France yep. um, they seemed to have really got the program together. Uh, I know they've been training well together for for the whole time. They've actually been in training with the Six Nations team as opposition. Wow. So, so they'll, they'll be a real threat. Um, they're, they're obviously, the next Olympics, the next World Cups are, are both in France. So I think I think we can all see where French rugby, male and female, is heading. Yep. They've got money. They've got numbers. Um, they've got all the got, money. You know, the all same. the numbers. <laughs> they do, mate. You know, it's, um, you know, professional sports about money and numbers, isn't it? Yep. So now that they, they feel like they've got, especially in the sevens, that they've got, a really good coaching settled, you know, coaching settled group. Um, they've, got, they've got a way they want to play. Um, they've become a real threat. They have a couple of Fijians in there, you know, that have got the residency that, that really give them that X factor. So, so yeah, I, you know, I genuinely think, you know, it's only 12 teams in the Olympics. Now, Korea have qualified because they beat Hong Kong in, in the Asia qualifiers. So you would, you would think they're, you know, they're going to be under the pump. But the other 11 teams, you know, Japan, the last Olympics, it was Brazil as the host nation. This time it's Japan. Now, Japan beat us in Oceania last year yeah. um, in, in, in Fiji. So, And then with not playing, you know, we've already started thinking what type of tournaments are going to be. It could be 40 degrees and 80% humidity. It could be rain. You know, I'm not sure it's going to be the most free-flowing sevens that you've ever seen. Yep. Um, we'd, we'd love to think that that's going to be the case, but I think we really have to have the mindset that you might have to win every game really tight and really tough. So that's how we're preparing. We're preparing mentally for what that might look like. We're trying to prepare a game that, that can cope and and still really deliver under pressure um, of heat, of rain, of you know tightness of games. Because as I say, I'd, I'd love us to think we're going to get there and win each game by two or three scores, but I'm not sure that's going to be the case considering what the last year and a half is going to have looked like. It's going to be awesome. Like it is going to be awesome for that tournament to be on, and and that the the sevens component is the first week. Are you guys the back half of the first week of the Olympics? Is that when we're looking out for you? We're the twenty sixth, so we're we're a couple of days in. So the men play before the the women this time. So yep. we play twenty sixth of July for three days, and then the the black fans start the, the day after that. So I think it's the twenty sixth to the thirty first. That's yep. right. Um, so yeah, it's the back end of that first first week. So you know, there's there's it's going to be a different Olympic experience. We can only go in now game day minus five to the village. We've got to be back out um, twenty four to forty eight hours after. Um, you know, which is you know, I guess it's like a bit more like a normal sevens tournament. Yeah. You know, we we go in game day minus five traditionally anyway, and we leave the day after or, or two days after a tournament. So. You know, and, and that side it's disappointing, you know, because the, the athletes and the staff would have loved to have, you know, went in early and, and yeah. experienced the village and and so on. But in another way, I guess it focuses your mind to get there and you know, we've got a job to do, um, to really prepare well for those five days, lean in and, and be ready to go on the on the twenty sixth. Brilliant. Great first half of the show, Clark. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, talk a little bit more about the All Black Stevens team, but also your journey from hopefully I say it right, Jedburg, Scotland now to being based in uh, Mount Monganui. Talk soon. They will offer up their own Harker. Hey! 
Mate, um, yeah, so as I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about yourself, your early days um, in Scotland and, and like, what were the early experiences and influences with you? Was it a, a rugby family, rugby town for you or, or were you fighting against the round ball? What was going on there for a, for a young Clark Laidlaw? <laughs> no, well, Jedburgh is in the Scottish Borders, which is, um, you know, we're a small town of about 4,000, 4,500 people. Uh, the Borders area is made up of of traditionally small rugby communities, um, quite a rural, um, you know, traditional rural part of the world. So, so now Jed, you know, my old man, uh, Roy, who, you know, played for Scotland in the Lions back in the 80s, um, obviously a rugby family, um, real similar to, I guess, the, the, the young New Zealand player who starts playing when you're five or six, you get down to Jed Forest, the rugby club, um, you know, you play from, whenever you're allowed to get down there, really. It was under sevens to start with, but I think I was there as a five-year-old asking if I could play full contact. And, and <laughs> you know, he just he didn't really know any difference. So we played in the town all the way through, you know, through through the mini rugby, through into the, which was called the midi rugby, which was under 14s and 16s, and then Jed Thistle, which was the, the under 18s club, and then transitioned to your senior club, which was Jed Forest. And, you I know, like we were Jed extremely Thistle lucky. As our, I like that. I like that very much. <laughs> then you know if you ever Google the Jed Thistle, we we played underneath the the Abbey, which is I guess nine hundred years old. Um, so it's a picture. You know, when you grew up, you never realised how picturesque the the rugby field was. You got a river and an Abbey that's nine hundred years old. It's awesome. it's actually unbelievable when I go back now and see it. So so yeah, we were we were lucky. We were club. You know, we had we were, I guess my old man was you know had, had played. We had other internationals that played, but at the time Gary Armstrong. The Scottish and British Lions halfback was when I played my first game for the club. He started at nine, and I was I was on the bench. So th- those were the days when you know I hadn't quite went professional just yet when I first played senior rugby. So you played club rugby games. It was I remember playing against uh, like say Watsonians that would have five, six, seven internationalists in the team. Um, and real similar to you know New Zealand when before it went professional. So. So we were really lucky. It was uh, it was a great you know great place to grow up and um, and start applying your your trade around playing rugby. Well, you say it was a sort of a, a standard um, experience growing up, but you know with your father being an international, you must have been fortunate enough to get along to Murrayfield a couple of times and and maybe even get in the change rooms or have some experiences that others don't, which um, must be pretty memorable. Yeah, I remember we got in the tunnel in the 1984 Grand Slam. Um, so I do remember going to that. And I was there in 1990 in the schoolboy enclosure when Scotland won the Grand Slam again. And my dad played in 84 and Gary played in 1990. Um, so as a young Jed, you know, Jed boy that only thought about rugby and not, not a lot else. It was a great experience. Um, and you did, you got to, you know, I remember the, the British Lions when they went to Australia, they, they came and trained all the Scottish um, Finley Calder and uh, the Hastings brothers and Craig Chalmers and Guy Armstrong all came and trained at Jed for their fitness leading up to that tour and you got to go down and kick balls to them and stuff so it was yeah we were you know really fortunate and at the time you, you probably didn't appreciate it you know looking back now how fortunate we were to mix and mingle with you know some of the best players I've ever played for Scotland but really probably inspired you you know deep down to, to try and give rugby a crack. Because it's um, not all our Kiwi listeners may or may not know this, but Sevens actually, was it, it basically started at Melrose in Scotland, didn't it? And the area you're from yeah. um, has always been um, really keen or traditionally been a Sevens area. Like um, I think you, you're you a Scottish Sevens representative for, what, six or seven years, was it? So there's a massive history there of Sevens, which a lot of Kiwis may not know. Yeah, well, Melrose, um, our claim to fame is that <laughs> Ned Haig, who who um, invented Sivens is actually from Jed. So he was a Jed man that lived in Melrose. He was a butcher in Melrose. Um, he's been buried in Melrose. Um, I actually just went to his grave last year um, when I was back in Scotland just to, to say good day. But, so <laughs> we, we grew up always playing Sivens. Um, school, under-18s, club, uh, the Border Spring circuit was, well, it got up to 10 tournaments where it was a bit like the World Series where you accumulated points. Um, in each town, Saturday, Sunday, you would play back-to-back um, tournaments every Saturday and Sunday. And you were usually a little bit fresher on a Saturday than you were a Sunday, especially if you were successful on the Saturday night. Of course. Um, 
so we, you know, we, we we just thought that was that was the norm, you know, that we played sevens back to back tournaments, um, not realizing when we eventually, you know, were lucky enough to play for Scotland that you know double days uh, were just the norm for us. Um, we played straight knockout, so if you, if you lost a game, you were out, um, and you, and you played four games every day. So you know it was just just the way we been brought up. So so Melrose was you know the home of sevens, the the World Cup is is called the Melrose the Melrose Cup. You know, so when we were lucky enough to win in San Francisco a couple of years ago, it was, you know, it was something I was really, really proud of and really fortunate. You know, it really meant a lot to me to to be involved with a team that could win the Melrose Cup in a, in a sevens, um, you know, with the sevens background that I do have. And, and, I, and I knew the history of, you know, where it all started. And mate, was it your old man who effectively, well, was very influential in sort of putting together the sevens program that you're a part of? Um, and putting a bit of structure in place around um, getting Scotland sevens going. Yeah, he was. Um, he actually came to New Zealand, spent a week with Titch. I'm not sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing because <laughs> when they came home, <laughs> uh, the running the running volume sort of changed. Um, but he was, and, and again for me, it was actually it was a negative because I couldn't get picked for the first couple of years because um, he knew what I couldn't do as opposed to what I could do, but. <laughs> He worked for the Scottish Rugby Union in Scotland, you know, back in sort of 99, 2000, then decided to to take sevens a little bit more serious and use it as a, you know, a development tool for younger players, um, you know, like a lot of the teams around the world um, and, and put some structure to it, as you say. So guys like Rob Moffat then coached the sevens, um, guys like Bob Eason was involved, who, you know, had a big influence on me as a player and probably as a coach. And um, the way they coached us in sevens was... You know, it was probably the first time I'd been coached with a real optimism and a real positivity that and then I just fell in love with 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 playing sevens. It was it was such a great game and such a challenge as as a younger player to try and cope um physically and mentally and te- technically and tactically on a sevens field. It was it was such a challenge that I felt like, you know, now that I'm coaching sevens, I, I really feel it does benefit players that play sevens or fifteens because it's, it's such a challenge. Oh, there's nowhere to hide on a sevens field, is there? Like, um, you know, there's there's a huge amount of space, and you've got to be on for the whole fourteen minutes, don't you, to to be a good player? Yeah, and any weakness you've got, you know, mentally, technically, tactically, I'll find it. You know, I'll find it real quick. So it's, you know, it's if you look at the the history of this team, the All Black Sevens, you know, it's no surprise that some of the best players I've ever played the game have. I've played some sevens, not always been in here for three or four years, but have have had some involvement with sevens because um, it really does open your eyes up to what what you need to be able to cope with when it you know when it comes big games under pressure or fatigue or different game plans or whatever you know everything that's involved in the game sevens really puts it under pressure um, in some way. Mate, and for you, was your playing highlight or career highlight um, as a player for Scotland heading to the comms games? I know you perhaps didn't do as well in the tournament as you wanted, but to go to a to go to a big event like that um, has to be really cool, and also probably serves you well um, in your role these days. Yeah, definitely. The, the, the comm games and World Cup. You know, I went to Manchester, but actually got injured in the comm games five days before we played, so I missed the comm games there. Um, and Scotland played New Zealand, and, and New Zealand had an unbelievable team in Manchester. Um, looking back now, and so that really motivated me to to hang in there with Sevens and, and try and give it another crack when I, you know, was a little bit older. Was to go to the World Cup in Hong Kong. You know, again we played New Zealand in the group. Uh, we lost to to England in the quarter final there, and, and then um, Melbourne was a was a great experience, and you know, really opened up my eyes to that multi sport. Uh, event, you know, the village, uh, the opening ceremony, the closing ceremony. We were so lucky. We we played the first two days, I think it was, in, in Melbourne, and we stayed on to go to Hong Kong, Singapore. So we had two weeks in the village where we basically trained as early as possible so then we could go and watch sport the rest of the day. Oh, yeah, good. So it was, um, it, yeah, it was so good. And then we went on to Hong Kong and Singapore and, and played another two tournaments. So, so yeah, it's, you know, and then with the Olympics coming on board, um, you know, and working with New Zealand back in 2011 and 12, it's certainly, it's always, you know, it's always been there, I guess, in my, either in my coaching or my playing, Simmons has always had an influence on, on where I've been. Mate, and how did you, how did you get to Kiwi Shores? Like, um, was it post 
your playing days and it was when you were getting into coaching that, that got you here to New Zealand. What was the process there? Yeah, well, I was I was working as a rugby development officer in Scotland. Um, you know, I was coaching, as I say, I was coaching under 16s and 18s with the Borders and and I was actually really enjoying that. But um, I had a mate, Davey Gray, who was a fitness trainer at the Hurricanes for the last 10 years. He was in Taranaki and um, he used to get in touch with jobs. He used to email jobs around and Long story short, I applied for a rugby development officer job in, in New Plymouth with Taranaki and I didn't tell my wife um, that I applied for the job, so that, that went down well. But um, <laughs> still I got off of the job. Still your actually... wife, though, right? Still your wife. <laughs> yeah, she is. Uh, she's my current wife. But, um, <laughs> so Mark, Mark Robinson was the CEO, um, who's obviously now the CEO with, with New Zealand Rugby. Um, and he offered me the job, but just those circumstances, we were pregnant with the first uh, girl and we turned the job down, but a year later, um, the, the guy that took the job had actually left. So Robert got back in touch, and we sort of just decided if we were going to go overseas, you know, I was I was motivated to to not just stay in Scotland. You know, I was I was probably progressing as a coach, um, but I think Simmons did open up my eyes to the world. You know, I wanted to. I was never good enough as a rugby player to travel to New Zealand and play. Um, so I thought, you know, we would come for a year and at least experience rugby in a different country and in a, in a different lifestyle. Um, you know, as I say, we came for a year in 2008 and we're still here. So, so that was, you know, as I say, it was, it was a short term option that we thought we would come and give it a go. And, you know, we've been so lucky around opportunities. We've had it both, both me and my career, but also us as a family since we got here. Mate, you've been pretty lucky. You've had a number of jobs in New Zealand. And, you know, I think in the early days at Taranaki, there was there was Bodie Barrett, there was Wasaki Naholo, like you say, Mark Robinson was your CEO, Michael Collins was a part of the Taranaki team as well. Um, you certainly landed on your feet, didn't you? But obviously, by um, must have learnt a lot, must have done a bloody good job to continue um, to get roles here in New Zealand, um, you know, leading up to being coach of the All Black Sevens um, after, the, after the last Olympics. Yeah, you know, as everybody says, timing's everything, isn't it? It's because um, you're right. Robo took over. Uh, Mike was there as the academy manager. I uh, still remember my first meeting with Mike, and he had shirts and jean shirts and jandals on, and <laughs> said he had no idea what he was doing. So, what did I think? <laughs> um, you know, and I think that the, the biggest stroke of luck was Coops coming back from the Hurricanes the year after, where um, his, you know. His manner, his, his ability to shape me as a young coach, um, his ability as a coach, uh, his ability to manage people really, really has influenced me massively around my own coaching. And, you know, that coincided with Taranaki obviously being, you know, reasonably aggressive in the market around their academy players, uh, Blade Thompson, Wysaki Naholo, people he talked about. So we ended up, you know, really as a whole group from Robo to Coops to Mike to myself um, to all the staff and players you know, working together to try and push Taranaki, you know, to ultimately when they won the, the ITM Cup. Um was a really exciting time. It was really sort of dynamic and um, a real fun time to be involved with our province. And on the back of that, as you say, you know, we got an opportunity to work with the Sevens team um, in 2011 and 12, ended up at the Hurricanes in 2013, um, you know, and then off, off to London Irish for a couple of years before I came back. So... So I, I genuinely feel, you know, really lucky to have been influenced by people like Robo and Coops in my early years in New Zealand. That, you know, as a younger coach, I was probably too uh, too enthusiastic, too, you know, I still had my Scottish uh, chip on my shoulder and a bit aggressive and so on. So it was uh, there were good people to really shape my early years as a as a young coach. Mate, to to fast forward to getting the All Blacks Sevens jobs, it's obviously off the back of of Titch being the coach and he was coach for 20 years um, and basically had been, it felt like the only coach of any sevens team in New Zealand for that period of time and and there were periods there where it was hugely successful. Um, your feelings going into that role after that period, nervous, excited, you know, um, looking back now? Yeah, both. Um, you know, it was hugely exciting around getting to work with a team that you know, I genuinely loved working with in the past um, and a team that you know, I thought could, you know, achieve on the field. Um, but certainly nervous around, you know, being a Scotsman coming in to coach a national team. Um, you know, there was, I guess, outside noise around a, a non-Kiwi for the first time coaching a national team and then, you know, taking over from 
from Titch, we have got a massive amount of respect for around what he done with this team. You know, I think people shouldn't underestimate what what Titch done for Sevens. You know, because if New Zealand hadn't taken Sevens seriously, it was and it was Titch that took it seriously. There would have been nobody to go against Fiji, which I, I genuinely think. If it hadn't been for New Zealand and Fiji, it would never become an Olympic sport and, and have the World Series the way it does now because there would be no competition. Yeah. You know, and when I was a player, you know, there was no real competition for New Zealand and Fiji. There was the odd Australian team or English team that, that chipped in now and again as, as it became a bit more professional. And then laterally, obviously, South Africa and, and the USA and teams like that have stepped up. But for a large proportion of that first 10, 15 years, it was only New Zealand and Fiji. So yeah, I was you know I was really conscious of that, and then really conscious of 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 coaching a team that has high expectations. And so yeah, nervous and excited was a was a really good way to describe it. Equal measures, I would think. And I know you would have been watching with a keen eye, not involved with the team at the time, but um, and we all would have loved as Kiwis to see um, the All Black Sevens be on the podium. But how good was it to see Fiji win a gold medal at the last Olympic Games? Like um, I think the only medal I've ever won. In Olympic Games, and um, I've also read um, the coach's book, which is a wonderful insight into into that mm. program. But it was everyone's sort of favourite second team, wasn't it? I think in New Zealand, like when they when they won the final, was it was pretty cool. Oh, a hundred percent. And I, I don't think you can not love watching Fiji play sevens. Yeah, it's um, it's a nightmare to coach against some days, <laughs> and um, you know, a bloody scary. Scary uh, proposition trying to beat them at the Olympics again this time for us. But as a rugby fan and a sports fan, you know, what a story that such a small country can achieve such great things in a sport, you know, that, you know, however it ended up there has become this uh, national obsession, which Seven is for Fiji. Um, you know, as you say, it's a, it's a great story and, and something that, you know, we, we genuinely love the opportunity to play against them when we get the chance. You know, that, that black jersey against the white jersey is, is what we think of in, in sevens, you know, and, and all the traditional tournaments have been won, you know, for the most part with, with either New Zealand or Fiji. So, you know, the, 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 the two games that stick out in my head are, are those two games when we played Fiji in the Com Games final. It was an amazing experience. And then the, the semi-final in San Francisco when... You know, Tuya Sova and um, Rindrandra and Nakarewa were all playing for Fiji. You know, they had a rock star team. Um, and it felt like there was ten or 15,000 Fijians in a, in a 40,000 crowd. It was it was such an amazing atmosphere. Um, I'll never forget that game and how well we how well we played to shut them down that day. So, so yeah, it's, you know, it's an exciting challenge and a, and a, and a great one. Mate, after... Um... You know, coming in behind Titch, who had been in the job for such a long time, you know, how do you put your stamp on the team, or you know, what was your focus when you got the job um, after the last Olympics? Um, you know, what did you try and achieve in that first three six months, first season with the side? Yeah, well, uh, you know, we we spent uh, the first couple of months just really trying to get to know people because we weren't centralised yet, so yep. we knew we were going to centralise in September October time. Um, so that was a big piece of work around how we centralised the team. Um, but we had to also work out who we centralised and, you know, both players and staff. So we really we really worked hard to work out who the people were and, you know, both both sides, um, staff and players. Then we genuinely spent the first three or four months trying to build a culture that we thought, you know, would represent us um, well on the field as well as off the field so I put a, you know, a massive amount of, of time and effort into trying to develop how we trained uh, how we operated as a team how the leaders would work um, and the rugby was almost last um, we, we left the rugby really simple looking back now you know, we made the final in Dubai and then won in Cape Town the first two tournaments. Um, how have we done that? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm not really sure when it comes to the rugby but I'm really sure around the, the motivation was there for the players because as you say, we hadn't really been successful for a couple of years. So in some ways, it was probably the best time ever to take over because our senior players and Tim Mickelson and Scott Curry and Sam Dixon and so on were, were hugely motivated around what had happened for the last couple of years. So making change was probably easier than, than it might have been. Um, you know, the traditional old way versus new way. If you've been successful, it's sometimes hard to convince people that the new way is the way to go. So... 
so in some ways it was really you know it was really easy to make some of the changes we wanted to make um, but we did have the pinnacle event of Com Games and World Cup so we we genuinely put all our attention to to try and get the people and the culture right and be really simple in our game and try and develop it slowly to try and genuinely peak for the Com Games and World Cup we we knew we couldn't win everything the first year. Um, we, we, as soon as we took the team over, we knew there was too much work to be done on, on, the, on the areas I'm talking about to, to try and really develop our game. So we spent more time on this side of it to, to make sure our game was really clear. And we still thought we had the players to deliver a game plan that we could we could win. Um, you know, unfortunate enough, we, we, we managed to do that because, as you know, in New Zealand, if we lose tournaments in the World Series, and then don't win the pinnacle events, people will be like, well, you know, what are we up to? Yeah. Um, but it is a different mindset in Simmons. It is a genuine pinnacle event sport. It's, a, it's an Olympics, it's an Acom Games, and it's a World Cup. And yes, there's World Series tournaments, but it's really difficult to, to try and juggle that over four years and win everything. So we, we've, you know, we've genuinely spent periods where we knew our performance would, you know, would be a little bit clunky and a little bit confused and, and not over the very best to try and peak at these events. Because would you say too, you know, often I've heard in different interviews, uh, someone like Richie McCaw or Dan Carter or, or Graham Henry say, you know, it was the toughest day ever, but the best thing that ever happened to them, you know, losing 2007 World Cup quarterfinal to France. Um, you know, would you say in retrospect, you know, losing at the, um, at the Olympic Games almost sort of like you hinted to, allowed you to come in with a clean slate? Like, did it force our hand with centralisation or was that going to happen anyway? Did it give you a bit of wiggle room to to put some new practices in place? You know, was that, you know, that big loss um, at the pinnacle event, as you put it, um, created this opportunity um, to have a clean slate? Because you were doing it with a lot of the same players, like you talk about um, Scott Curry, Sam Dixon. These boys ha- had been there before. Yeah, I think 100%. You know, pain and suffering is a is a great way of making change. You know, so there's, there's three ways you make change, and pain and suffering is definitely one of them. So, so it allowed us to to change our game. Allowed us to, you know, you talk about centralisation. Would we have centralised if we hadn't lost the Olympics? You know, I'm I'm not sure, but there wouldn't have been the same push for both the teams to come here. And and the way the world, you know, the world series used to be somewhere between six and twelve tournaments. It's now a stand of ten tournaments for the men and, and eight or nine for the for the women's team. So if you don't centralise, having camp, it, it's logistically, it's, it's almost impossible to not be together um, and, and live here. So yeah, it's, it, it really allowed us to, to really think, well, where have we been? Why are South Africa more consistent than us? Why are Fiji winning pinnacle events? Um, you know, why are we so inconsistent? So it was, um, as I say, it was, it was as good a time as any to, to probably take over a team that, you know, traditionally I've been really strong and we still had some really strong areas of the of the team that we could keep going. Um, but we also had some areas we thought we could modernise and, and probably change. The game had changed, you know, a bit around the, the physical aspects of the game. It's become a lot more aligned to a 15s type game where the, the strength and power and repeated power actions like a, you know, a top super rugby game are, are a lot more similar to, the, you know, the the pure running based game that, that used to be you could keep the ball away from teams, you know, and, and the fences weren't that organized that you could basically run around and keep the ball, keep the ball away from teams. You know, that, that's changed as South Africa and England and these teams brought in defensive systems. Yeah, it's it's amazing actually if you go back and look at some of the those um famous Hong Kong Sevens tournaments that Jonah and Christian that were playing and even the Fijians used to play that way as well, was just to keep the ball alive, keep it out of contact. Now when you watch a game of sevens between yourself and South Africa, there's <laughs> some very, very direct play in there as well, isn't there, to, to create that space later on. It's actually, f- it's goddamn phenomenal how fast some of these big units are, those big lumps South Africans who can also run like the wind. It's it's completely changed, hasn't it? And I suppose that's it's to what you're talking about. It's centralised, there's a big schedule now, um, so you can be a specialist sevens player and... and um, be big, fast, and explosive, which is a scary thought. Yeah, they're amazing athletes. You know, you look at oh. the Kenyans before. The Kenyans are huge men, they're <laughs> huge. Um, you know, you get you get some of the Fijian boys or the African boys that are the Canadians. Canadians have got some massive athletes, um, and it, yeah, it's changed. You know, we we still genuinely try and keep the ball away away from teams, but 
you know, eventually you've got to come toe to toe. So you've got to make sure you get the body types that can, you know, can mix it in the breakdown the same as the same as the 15s game. Um, and, you know, the, the Simmons player has, you know, some of our boys are, you know, 105 Caleb Clark's a good example, 110 kg. Celeste was 110 kg last year. Um, you didn't really see that in Simmons fields 10 years ago. Um, you know, even maybe five or six years ago, it's probably changed again. So, so yeah, it's a hugely physical. We we sometimes describe it a four hundred meter sprint with a UFC fight, <laughs> and another another four hundred meter sprint. You know, that's a type of uh, almost a type of mentality and type of athlete you're after. Somebody that can sprint for four hundred meters, fight somebody one on one, and then do it again. Ah, uh, mate, I'm sure when you guys are going live against each other at training, you'd see some sights. You'd see some pretty, um, some pretty intense five minutes of footy because you know I'm sure. Even at the professional level, it's no different to the grassroots. You go harder against your mates at training sometimes than you do on a Saturday. I'm, I'm sure you guys still go bloody hard in the tournaments, but that mentality is in most people, isn't it? Yeah, it's you know I said to you before. Yesterday was as good a game of sevens as I've seen possibly anywhere in the world. Um, so you're right when the, the boys go go against each other. You know, you, as a coach, you're sort of looking a little bit sideways, hoping that. You know, we don't tip each other up or injure each other uh, live Sit and train. Sit back, mate, and go. My job's done here. This is how good's this. Look at these boys tearing yeah. to it. But um, you, you know, some of the stuff you're talking about, the amount of games you got to prepare for. Um, you know, trying to get things right on and off the field. Huge undertaking. But it's not just yourself. You've got uh, Tomasi Thama and Liam Barry along with you as well. And I'm sure you lean a lot on on some of those old dogs like Tim Mickelson. Um, you know, um, your captain Scott Curry. Kurt Baker, an old dog as well. Like, is is it about spreading the load a wee bit and and making more than one person accountable for the performance of the team? Yeah, you know, all coaching teams and, and teams the modern way is is definitely that way. You know, certainly here in New Zealand, the players you know have a massive impact on, on how you know how we play the game and how we run the team. You know, guys like Joe Weber, who's as good a Simmons brain as anywhere in the world, I would think. You know, Joey coach. You know, he runs with defence. Um, and coaches it and you know with Tomasi and Liam um, we sometimes say it's a bit like a bad joke isn't it a Scotsman a Fijian and a, and a Kiwi but it's a really good mix you know Tomasi he obviously played for Manawa 2 and, and played 15s but as a, as a Sevens genius and, and sees the game better than anybody you know around the attacking side and, and Liam's traditionally you know he's a traditional forwards coach that, that hasn't been involved in Sevens so and I've been lucky enough to, to coach in both and, and probably sit in between so between the three of us especially when we started, it was a really good mix that, that Liam would ask why. Why do you do this? Why don't you do that? And Tomasi would sometimes answer, well, it's because it's sevens. Or... So then we were able to really try and shape our game um, and something we've really stayed conscious that we don't want to just do things because it's sevens. We need to make sure it's the best thing for the game. Um, so we use 15s coaches to have a look at our games and, and so on, or players, as you say, going to minor 10 and coming back. I've come back with little ideas that picked up, you know, either in leadership or, or training or, or how we play the game. So I think that integration between all the staff, you know, fitness trainers, physios, senior players, it's quite an exciting dynamic um, mix. And, and my job as a head coach is really to create the environment that we stay aligned to, to what we want to do, you know, stay inspired around getting up every day and, and wanting to get to work and, and be enthusiastic. Um, you know, as a head coach, sometimes he, the rugby becomes the smaller part of what you think about, um, especially when you've got so many good people in the building. Mate, a couple of things to finish. One, um, you sort of touched on a little bit there, but it's something I've heard you refer to in a different interview. Is it, you say, naive experts? So it's about getting, um, yep. you know, other coaches who aren't necessarily specialists. Well, I'll let you talk about it. Specialist sevens coaches, what do you do with them? Yeah, well, we give them a... A group of games, usually games we win and games we lose. Um, you know, so last year we sent 12 games out to people in the UK and some coaches here that um, we respect as rugby coaches and not necessarily got anything to do with sevens. Um, sometimes they do, you know, like uh, Roger Randall's had a look right. that's played sevens and coached sevens. Ozzy McLean's had a look, Tom Coventry, um, Joe Smith. So we're, we're lucky that we can use our contacts um, and we just give them games with no agenda and ask them to see what they notice. Um, Russell Earnshaw in the UK that probably picked up the naive expert off. Um, yeah. He's a save. So we, we, we genuinely just send the games out with no agenda and ask them to tell us what they see. And then sometimes it really, really confirms what we've been seeing. 
Um, but sometimes has a completely different lens on maybe with forward play or, you know, why don't we have as much line speed in, as, as of, of slow ball? Um, you know, so it really challenges us to think, right, well, where can our game go? You know, what areas are we, you know, where's our blind spots? Because they see it slightly different. So sometimes they throw it up, you know, as I say, there's been some random stuff, but there's also been some real confirmation of we're on the right track in areas. So it's, it's something we really enjoy and, you know, really appreciative of the people that do it. You know, they give up their time to, to have a look at our games and it's um, it's something I think we'll, you know, we'll always do is, as long as we're involved with this team. It's um, It's been a really good, you know, a really good ally to, to our own eyes in here. And the other thing I've heard you speak about a little bit is is measuring effort because you hear most sports teams, you know, so many sports teams say we need to go out and give our best. We need to try really hard. You need to give it 100, empty the tank. But actually... How do you measure that sometimes? And I know you put a little bit of work into in sevens, what that looks like. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we, we basically measure people getting off the ground and, and moving into position. Um, both sides of the ball is, is probably the simplest way to describe it. And it's it's really interesting once you, you know, what, what you focus on is what you get, isn't it? So if you focus on getting off the ground quickly and moving into position um, and what that looks like, what are the movements, what, what are the shape you want, to have both sides of the ball, it's amazing how quickly people get off the ground and move into position. So, you know, it's over a weekend. We, you know, there's there's not a lot you can do technically over, you know, if a guy misses a tackle, you can't, you've not got a week to fix it up. You know, we we sometimes think that three hour window between games one and two or two and three, it's a bit like a week in 15s where you got to play, recover, cool down, you know, fuel, um, review, preview the next opposition, then go, okay, we do, you know, a week's work sometimes in three hours or overnight. Um, so it's important we, we get really clear on what we think is important for a weekend, but we can't change a whole heap of stuff. We've got slight tactics maybe we can change in, in areas of the game, but effort is one thing we genuinely measure over a weekend, making sure that it stays where it needs to be. And we and we show clips, we, we review it, we talk about it. Um, and we've had some great examples of guys chasing from the far side of the field to keep a player out that misses a conversion and then we go on and win by two points or, or score next. Um, so we just think it's really important. You know, we, we, we genuinely think if we can have our effort um, where it needs to be, which is, you know, in some of our big games now, we're getting up to 100% both sides of the ball on what it looks like. Um, usually the performance can can play off the back of that. Mate, there's so much we should chat about, but I um one thing I want to ask you as we wrap up is I know um you put a huge amount of focus on on building culture with the team and and from the interactions I've had with the players down on the mount, they're good mates. They all get along well. You've got a great mix of Pacifica, Maori, New Zealand, European who have come together really well. And I know singing's a big part of the team. How's your singing, mate? I'm not going to make you sing <laughs> on Zoom, mate. But do you do you throw a a couple of Scottish classics in the mix, you know. Do they have to walk five hundred miles, or do you know we keep it? You know, are you front and centre? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's about time we're a Scottish one. We yeah, bloody you know, yeah. They, they, they take um, great delight in my Fijian and Samoan and Tongan singing and Maori <laughs> singing. Um, so yeah, a couple of Scottish classics might be. Uh, we've just finished learning a new Maori song that was man, it's difficult. But it's, you know, it's you're right. The, the, the cultures, you know, seven is a unique environment. We, you know, we've got 20 players here that live together, um, travel the world together, um, you know, and something we have really developed is a real performance culture that goes alongside, you know, the genuine fun and connection side of our culture. Um, and I think we're really maturing now to, you know, how we prepare, how we hold each other accountable to our training standards and, and how we play and. and having our knowledge right around, you know, any area of the game. It's, it's, um, cause it's a real balance. We can't just be best mates and, and then have fun, which we all do, but we've got to make sure we can drive each other to, to produce a performance when it really matters. So, so I've really enjoyed the way the players are developing that at the minute. It's something that the, the senior groups really, really drive and is that real performance side to our culture and, and tying it in, um, alongside, you know, that fun and connection that we have off the field. Mate, thanks so much for joining us. I won't keep you any longer. It's um, It's been an awesome chat and there's so much more we could talk about and maybe hopefully we will um, before or after the Olympics and, and fingers crossed that 100% goes ahead. What's um, Just remind us again, what are we looking out for as fans? What's um, Will we see any of the games on telly you are talking about down in Wellington? Um, 
before you head away to the Olympics? Yeah, well, I think we're hopeful the games are going to be broadcast on the Sunday, so we're going to play in Wellington on the on the Friday Saturday. And then uh, the both teams are going to play before, I think it's the Hurricanes Crusaders game on the Sunday afternoon. So we're going to play before and after. Um, so obviously if they're at the stadium, then they can, they can get there early and watch us play and, and stay for a little bit longer. And I think we're pretty hopeful that Sky TV is going to pick it up and um, broadcast it. So it's quite exciting. You know, it's it's genuine a year and a bit since we've played inside a stadium with a, with a crowd. So, you know, I know the players... And the staff are really excited around getting down to Wellington for the week. It's, um, it's old school. We're bringing back Wellington Seven, so get along, uh, mate. I've uh, I've done my apprenticeship down there, and uh, hell of a time. Um, that's another <laughs> podcast. That's another podcast, um, mate. Thank you so much, buddy. I'll let you go. I know you've got um, much to do down there. I'm um, in the bay. Enjoy the good weather. Um, and as I said, mate, we hope to get you back. And, and good luck for the tournament. Um, in Wellington and your preparations in general. You've got, you got a great crew of lads down there and we're wishing you all the best. Cheers, thanks a lot. No worries, mate.